Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us on the, this next episode of the Akad and Coca Report. I'm Michelle Akad in San Francisco, and I'm flying solo today. My co-host, Anish Coca, was last spotted logging into the uh, electronic health record and hasn't been seen since then. So any information leading to, uh, to, his, uh, you know, to finding him will uh, please send it to akadancoca.com. Today, we will be talking about the Swiss healthcare system, which is frequently proposed as a model for the rest of the world to emulate. That position is held by many liberals as well as many conservatives, uh, at least in the United States. Not long ago, the, the New England Journal of Medicine featured an editorial entitled Individual Responsibility and Community Solidarity, in which the healthcare system of Switzerland was described as one that could strike a good balance between access, quality, and cost. To better gauge the claim, we decided to reach out to someone with first-hand experience of that system. Our guest is Mark Furadulas, who practices medicine in Zurich, Switzerland. He is a board-certified internist with a subspecialty in psychosomatic medicine, and he holds a master's degree of advanced studies in managed healthcare and health economics from the Winterthur Institute of Health Economics, School of Management and Law in Zurich. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you for inviting me. We're delighted to have you. And so I'm going to ask you to just briefly describe, uh, you know, in broad brush strokes, strokes what the, uh, the Swiss healthcare system uh, is like, if you can do that in a few minutes. Sure, sure. Um, so, uh, I'd like to say first that uh, every healthcare system is hugely complex. I think we all know that and nobody really knows what's, what's going on in, in which corner of a certain healthcare system. But uh, to put it uh, out broadly, what we have is a mandatory health insurance system. So everybody has to get a health insurance. Um, so he signs up with the health insurance uh, uh, company. Um, there are around 60 non-profit health insurance companies and uh, by that he gets covered a really broad basket of ambulatory and inpatient services. Okay. Um, it, it's almost, uh, it's, there are not many limitations. Yeah. Uh, Mark, can I ask you, your microphone, can you move it just a little bit? I think just a little bit down and there may be less, yeah, yeah. either up or down. I think the sound might, might be a little bit better. Yeah, try, try like that. Okay. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. That's much better. Yeah. Good. So, so uh, you need to sign up with a health in, insurance company for a, for a healthcare plan. And, uh, and then you get this uh, uh, access to uh, uh, lots of different uh, healthcare services. You will have, uh, based on your plan, uh, a free choice of a doctor and um, you will have access to lots of uh, specialty care. Um, okay. So, so that's, a, that's a mandatory health insurance. In fact, it's, it's very decentralized, uh, the whole system. So there are like, uh, you know, in the Swiss structure, it's 26 cantons and each canton, a uh, canton is a county, and each, each of these counties has its own uh, system and healthcare minister and uh, it can be quite different from each other so it's quite decentralized and then uh, and then still uh, there's an aspect that it's centralized which is the pricing so we have okay. uh, be before we get that there just uh, so who pays for the the insurance premium so it's individuals right it's not the employers or the businesses no each yeah, individual is supposed or each family will pay for their insurance premium yeah, yeah, and that's independent of your income. Okay, and um, and for people who cannot afford the premium, or is there or are the premiums so low that people everybody can afford the premium? No, no, that's a big thing. Uh, so you will get subsidies if your income is too low, and uh, that's between twenty-five and thirty percent of the population that receive subsidies. So, so it's quite a big part. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned this, and to me, this sounds like Obamacare. Is that did, did we actually replicate uh, the Swiss system in the U.S. because Obamacare is making health insurance mandatory, and then subsidizing the people who cannot afford it? Now, of course, the difference here is that many people who are insured are insured through their employer, um, which is not the case in Switzerland. Uh, but at least in that respect, it seems th there seems to be a similarity. 
between um, uh, Obamacare or the Affordable A uh, Care Act and, and the Swiss system. And yeah, uh, it's a sure it is. similarity, but it is a, a similarity, nevertheless. And the insurance companies are private. In Switzerland, completely, there is no government insurance. Is that correct? Is there is there a government? Uh, uh, no, no, no. no. It's, so uh, even it's the elderly, the, everybody yeah. is, is private. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure how how Swiss it really is. I mean, there is a certain there are certain models for healthcare insurance. I think the, maybe you've heard of the Enthoven plan, which uh, which is this, this kind of model with with uh, health insurance and mandatory access, and uh, and uh, that's what has been um, introduced here with the uh, uh, federal law in in '96. Yeah. No, I'm I'm not aware. So so that's that's a government sponsored uh, health plan. No, that's just a, that's just a model, uh, a model uh, how you can structure healthcare, health insurance on a national basis. I see. Yeah, yeah. But indeed, there are similarities and uh, between Switzerland and the U.S. and uh, and the Swiss system has even been uh, named. You know, it's the the USA of Europe because uh, traditionally it has been more pro-market and uh, liberal. I suppose, yeah. I suppose in that, re in that respect, I mean, the fact that there's no government financing, uh, direct government financing of healthcare, uh, you could see it that way. Um, uh, you know, on the other hand, it's, it's a mixed bag because there's government intervention nevertheless. I mean, if the government makes health insurance mandatory, that's a huge, you know, intervention in the healthcare market. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you were you were going to say, talk about uh, pricing and how the, the 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 prices because that's a very big deal right now in the United States. Everybody finally has realized that the problem is, you know, the the, the prices of health services is uh, through the roof here. How is it done in the in, in Switzerland? Okay, so um, with this introduction of uh, mandatory health care, there was a, an attempt to to harmonize pricing because before it was regulated on a, on a decentralized level, you know, each county uh, negotiated prices between insurance companies and the county. And then uh, there was this attempt to create uh, like a centralized uh, system of all services that you can, you can apply and you can fee. And it took a couple of years. I think it's, it's been up to six years to develop that that uh, service fee uh, scale yeah which right. was then introduced uh, in, in in 2004 and uh, since then it's uh, it's it's um, a cemented system yeah. okay so Lots it's interesting because you use the term harmonize which is a very nice sounding term that I think health policy yeah. people always use they say we're going to harmonize things but what it is really is price controls is that correct? So, so sure. there's a set fee and it's a, it's a price control. And so the prices have been set since 2004. Yeah, the, the current price. The current prices for all the services. So the, there's a code for each type of service, whether it's imaging or yeah. consultation yeah. or outpatient yeah. or this and that. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's several thousand and, and it was calculated based on numbers in the 90s and, you know, numbers from from solo medical practices, and then uh, they're, they're not contemporary anymore, of course. Right, uh, there's no adjustment for inflation from year to year for, you know, uh, no, the cost no, of, no? No, no? Is that right? Huh, so how, how do doctors feel about that uh, uh, now, you know, uh, 14 years later? Well, uh, you know, this uh, pricing system has played out differently for, for specialists and uh, practitioners. Uh, some were, I think, uh, um, lucky uh, in a situation with their, with their fees and, uh, and used it and uh, uh, grew wealthy. <laughs> and for others, it was uh, very frustrating. So there was uh, largely no uh, change, but it was aware that it was uh, like clear that uh, it needs to be adjusted and, and that that was tried by these uh, negotiating parties over around eight years 
so, so the doctors and insurers and the hospitals came together and tried to negotiate on a national level. You know, how can we you now get the right price? <laughs> You know, what's the right fee here for everybody in Switzerland on this uh, specific... So, so uh, even in the, in the land of uh, precision Swiss uh, watches, you cannot come up with a precision fee setting for the entire country. Yeah, and you know what? They still, they still try to get the perfect pricing system. I mean, they still continue negotiating, although it failed after eight years. And... Uh, and the, the healthcare minister needed to uh, intervene. So it's, it's quite impressive how these large scale attempts of price control did not, of course, not work, but still has captured its participants uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a bit naive way, you know, to, to just um, believe in a solution. Pricing is something we don't negotiate between each other, but somebody in a central um, office. And, right. and uh, I hardly see anybody questioning it. You know, nobody would dare question, yeah, listen, I want, to, I want my own prices. Um, right, uh, because uh, it, it, it means that it doesn't matter whether you're good or bad, you get paid the same. Yeah. Exactly. Right, uh, number one. And number two, you mentioned uh, the, some specialties, maybe uh, privileged. Um, so I don't know what those might be, but let's say uh, radiology or ophthalmology or something like yeah. that. I mean, yeah. I, I would imagine would be for some reason privileged over the primary care physicians, right? So sure. is there sure. a big income difference between primary care physicians and specialists in Switzerland? Yeah, very big. It's a huge gap. It's a huge gap, and, and actually, the, with this introduction of the service fee system, uh, it was intended to uh, um, increase the pay for a general practitioner. But uh, <laughs> it didn't work out. Uh, it, it didn't work out, and of course, I mean, um, you know, if your if your fees are not good, what will you do? You will increase the quantity. Yeah, of course. So it's, of course, it's because then you right, you get paid per visit, so you ask the patients to come back perhaps more frequently or that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, that's uh, yes, that's a kind of a sobering um, uh, take on, on the the Swiss healthcare system that we otherwise you know frequently hear hear about as being a good model. Now that being said, to be the doctors to make the, to be the devil's advocate, not the doctor's advocate, the devil's advocate. Um, Swiss doctors make a decent living right now? I mean, there aren't, you know, are they, uh, uh, do you get a sense of that? Or, or are uh, primary care physicians actually struggling? Or yeah, it, it depends where, where you look at. Uh, so if you look at primary care physicians, it's, it's, it's not that great. Huh? So recently there was a study by the, the UBS bank and they compared it and um, uh, it wasn't that great, so there was an income of around 130, 140 thousand a year, Swiss francs, and and that's largely equal to US dollars. Okay. And um, and that's been, of course, steady, you know, for the past um, 15 years because the fees were stable, and um, and it's, I mean, it's a lot of uh, it's a lot of work and responsibility for that. Uh, amount of money and then a specialist might uh, make half a million uh, or more so um, right so compared to other countries here in Europe like Austria uh, it was not so great uh, the comparison so I can't imagine many too many people choosing to go into primary care or or I mean it's it's possible that that uh, one one consequence of this is that the, the specializations continues yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, so the incentive, of course, has declined. Huh? You're going to work a lot, have a lot of responsibility, and your your service fees are going to stay the same for the next 10, 20 years. Right. And, uh, that was actually the message back in the in '96 in with this vote, because at the same time it was uh, introduced to keep the fees neutral. Like you know, we don't want increasing fees because. We, the whole thing was introduced to, to control costs. Uh, 
and uh, and by that um well they succeeded <laughs> in a way yeah in, in a, a way, way they succeeded. in a way you know in a in a nominal way of these uh the service fees yes because then you should have realized uh, my fees will never increase anymore but all other prices will and then i need to focus on which fee is best and um and how can I increase the quantity? And that's of course what happened, you know, uh, quantities grew uh, largely and, uh, and on the other side, there was a, the regulator's response to control quantity. And that's what happened recently. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's all about gaming the system, you know, and controlling the system from the regulator. Right. So in what way are they, are they uh trying to, to keep the, the, the physicians from uh, increasing volume. How can they do that? Yeah, so you will increase, uh, control the number of uh, how many times did you build a certain service, uh, like a physical checkup. Um, how long will you see the patient? And now um, each visit has been reduced to 20 minutes maximum which I think is, is, is still uh, fair enough uh, compared to other countries. But, right, uh, that's, um, you know, in the US, at least the effective time in the US is, I don't know if it's seven to 12 minutes, something like that, the, the, the effective amount of time spent face to face between the doctor and the patient. Yeah, I've heard that too. So um, um, tell me a little bit about, um, because I, I want to talk uh, in a few minutes about the perspective from, from the, the patient side and how, how the population views it. But right now for the physicians, in the US, you know, a lot of doctors complain that they spend an inordinate amount of time uh, trying to, to get pre-authorizations for procedures to get the okay. Uh, does it happen like that in Switzerland, that if you want to order an MRI for your patient, do you need to get authorization from the, uh, the insurance company, or if you want to order a certain medication, um, how, how does that work? Uh, not so much for imaging, but uh, of course, certain, certain expensive medication. Yeah, you need to uh, ask, uh, you know, write to your insurance company, um, but still largely uh, that's not, not uh, such a problem. But what I want to say is that Within this system, we, uh, we are um, mandated to get a contract with an insurance company. So once you're, once you're board certified and you get your license from the county, the insurance company have to contract you. So every doctor gets a contract and everybody can build the insurance. So this is some, some sort of business guarantee. Because once you're in, you know you can you can build uh, quite uh, well, quite a lot, right? And um, from that perspective, I think it's um, it's not that bad. Huh? So 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 once right. you read, so, so far the insurance mm. companies have not responded by trying to interfere with your ability to order things that much. Because here they, they, they do, or they try to, uh, at least nominally, to, to make it more difficult to try to, to have a lot of uh, uh, roadblocks to, to induce you to, to use fewer services or cheaper services. Yeah, so for example, for inpatient uh, treatments, uh, this is increasing. So if you want to send somebody for um, like a rehabilitation, um, um, a stay, uh, it will, you will have to ask for your insurance and you have to argue why it's necessary. And, um, and also for psychiatry care. I, but for, for outpatient care, not so much. Uh, I don't see uh, much of a problem. I still find it's, it's quite uh, um, leger. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, we can see, I can see how the situation is uh, troublesome for doctors uh, with this, you know, price fixing. Uh, how are the patients uh, or the population reacting to that? Have they been shielded so far? Do they still feel that, you know, the, from their perspective, the system is working pretty well? They're getting subsidies to pay for the insurance premiums. Um, 
or is there now a, you know getting to be a lot? Is it more difficult to get a primary care physician? What's, what's the situation from the, the perspective of the patient? Well, I think uh, so for the patient, if you're really in trouble, you will you will find somebody easily. Uh, you can you will get access to care uh, anywhere, and you, there are lots of walk-in clinics. So so it's not a problem to to get medical care. It's um, maybe if if you're looking for somebody like uh, um, like a, your personal trust doctor for over long term uh, who you re can rely on, that might be difficult uh, because uh, what we have is a growing number of um, corporations that run practices, uh, group practices in which uh, physicians are employed and um, and access is easy but are you going to trust them you know less, less they have to run a policy right and uh, and uh, as a patient you don't know how much they will bill so you don't really know what's what's in their interest you know what's in the agenda of the, of the employed doctor so so in, in that sense it's it's all a bit um, convoluted sure sure that's uh, and and to be expected that uh, they be, becomes more depersonalized and um, and doctors feel less invested in providing personal care and and um, since they don't get rewarded accordingly. Uh, yeah, and uh, I'd like to add here uh, because um, it's uh, since it's it, there's quite a high number of doctors here and there's a lot of supply, so so you will easily find a doctor, you will get access and and from 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 many doctors' perspective, it's um, there is a moral hazard, you know, on the, on the patient side. So it's um, what uh, what can be termed a, like a disregard for the value they get. Uh, so it's uh, get a quick fix there right. at the doctor's right. place, and um, and um, it's like you pay ten percent. Of the price, that's your copay. That's the so, standard copay for most services, about ten percent yeah, of the price. Yeah, yeah. Right. And since the price is fixed over the years, it hasn't increased. That copay hasn't increased, right? That much? No, no, it hasn't. So you pay your premium, and then you get access, and you're paying ten percent of the price, and um, so so you lose track of the value. You know right. what you get, uh, what should you pay for, and. Uh, many doctors feel like there are lots of patients that uh, consume, so they're not, yeah. They're, right, right. But again, the uh, on the other hand, the, the, the health policy people will say, well, look, we have a great uh, longevity, the life expectancy is good, yeah, exactly. um, yeah. infant mortality, you know, they use the statistics to, to reassure themselves that, you know, Okay, fine. The, the the doctors are complaining, but overall, this is uh, not so bad. Where do you see the trend going? Um, uh, you know, uh, in that respect, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it's going to get better. You may be at a, uh, in general, at a more uh, enviable position compared to the U.S. First of all, I think you have a much healthier population to begin with. I was looking in this paper from the New, New England Journal, uh, which I will link on the show notes. You know, the, the uh, uh, prevalence of um, uh, obesity in, uh, in the Swiss population is, is less than in the U.S. Um, the prevalence of diabetes is much less. The prevalence of uh, HIV infection, you know, chronic diseases tends to be much less. So in general, I think you have a healthier population. Mm, that's possible. Um, yeah. uh, at least it seems that way on paper. Um, and so, you know, the numbers look good. Uh, what about um, uh, the um, uh, percent of the GDP? Again, that seems to be somewhat reassuring, although it's a little bit higher than other places, right? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's reached 12% of GDP recently. Yeah. Okay. And that's, uh, that's a bit The US, is, I think, is 18 or 18 to 19%. Yeah, 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 yeah quite a lot. Right. So, so what's, what's the pain point? Uh, is it just going to be the doctors who will grumble and maybe grumble more and more? Or do you think at some point, uh, uh, you know, there'll be other problems that will 
uh, become more manifest than they are today? Well, I mean, the, the trend is quite clear. Huh? There's, a, there's a growth of um, around 4 to 5 percent of uh, healthcare costs annually. Yeah, so also your insurance premium goes up 4 percent. Um, it's been like this for decades. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's growing faster than GDP. It's it's growing a lot faster than your your wage, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, there's a lot of alarmism each year. And uh, last year there was this uh, intervention by the health care minister, you know, to to change uh, certain fees. Uh, it was, of course. Um, um, <clears throat> Not very popular, but um, uh, it was not without a uh, um, solid foundation because there was some kind of abuse in the system. So it, it's not just that all doctors are like playing fair and you know we're just trying to help. It's, it's you know it, it's also about uh, how sure. much can you gain the system, right? Yeah? Of course. And then and then you need to face consequences. And um, and now looking down the line. I think there, there might be more rationing uh, in the future in certain areas. And um, uh, there are ideas of, uh, of, of budgeting, you know, uh, introducing global budgets uh, in certain areas. Um, so so which, on which basis you, you will see patients and you get a fee uh, for like three months and, uh, and then you you don't have this incentive of um, billing service fees to increase your income. Um, that might be the consequence. Right. So more, more interventions. I mean, it's uh, yeah. the natural evolution is more and yeah. more interventions. Listen, uh, uh, I don't think it will go the other way in, in like liberalizing or uh, loosening the contract obligation of doctors. Um, so in, in a way... So, you know, on this show, we, we've talked a lot about, uh, you know, the hopeful trend of um, direct care. So yeah, doctors who yeah. decided, you know, they've had enough and they're going to go and, and uh, offer their services. It seems to me that right now in, in Switzerland, that would be um, economically a lot more challenging for a doctor to try to do this uh, on their own. Um, because they really, if, if the patient has the choice of either going to the system and only pay a 10% copay, versus going to yeah, somebody outside yeah. the system, it, it, yeah, it's yeah. almost, uh, you know, impossible unless the system becomes so bad or so congested uh, um, yeah. or the fees yeah. of the direct care doctor can be so low that, you know, there may be a benefit. Yeah. But at this stage, it seems to be difficult. Do you see any of that? Is there any trend or any, is it even allowed? Um, or uh, are the doctors, I mean, would a doctor be allowed to open a private clinic and not accept insurance and, and just uh, see patients on, because I know it's illegal in, in, in Canada, for example. Yeah, no, sure, sure, sure. You may, you may open your own practice and have a private fees, but who's going to come there if they have to pay the insurance premium, which is around $400 a month, you know, why would you go to a, a private care doctor? Right. What you cannot do is, you know, combine, um, insurance and private fees. So, so once you're in the insurance system, you have to use it and it's either or other. I see. As a doctor, you mean? Yeah. As so doctor, either yeah. you opt out completely, which is um, more or less the same here, at least with Medicare. Um, uh, doctors cannot be with Medicare and, you know, I mean, they have to, to be, you know, to make a choice, uh, a more radical choice. Mm. Yes. Well, um, you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm uh, confirmed in my my uh, uh, my initial bias that that uh, you know as as skilled and and uh, and rational as the Swiss may be and um, and judicious you know that uh, even the Swiss healthcare system cannot really be serve as a model uh, and in fact in many ways it already incorporates some of the uh, um, the ideas that have already been implemented here or. It will follow suit. Will get. Will will follow in uh, the pathway that we're encountering here in the United States. Well, uh, there's some similarity because uh, what what we introduced in in '96 is uh, similar to what you're doing now with Obamacare. So you know, uh, 
mandatory insurance and care for all and uh, uh, risk equality of insurance premiums and um, uh, that's similar so 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 if you accepted that you will go the same road as we did you know i mean the insurance premium will increase and and um, it's not a solution but uh, what i want to say uh, about what we talked about before is that i mean there's still liberal attempts here and, and one is to increase your um, deductible to like a lot higher and then uh, liberalize your service fee which which would be a way to go and and here in switzerland in, in theory it would be possible to go to uh, to to start an initiative you know public initiative and have a a vote for that right and so the benefit for the patients is that their premiums would might be less yeah their deductibles yeah. would be yeah. higher and then the yeah. doctors would be able to set to have a little more freedom on how the fees are set yeah yeah you still you, i think you would you would be able to to set your fees because of course it's in the interest of the insurance that you have you have lower fees and um in that way, you know, if there was a, a, an initiative by the public, that would work. So, so if the frustration grows too big within the uh, population, then this is possible because I don't think from top down there would be very useful um, uh, solutions. Right. And, yeah. Uh, but you know, the, the subsidy is pretty generous for the for the insurance premium so far. Um, yeah. But. Yeah. But maybe it's unsustainable, or maybe there'll be, you know, the, the, the governments will also decide that they cannot continue to subsidize insurance premiums the way they have uh, so far. Yeah, it's, uh, it's growing problematic, I think, for, for, for counties to, to subsidize, to continue with subsidies, and then they must, uh, you know, uh, increase the threshold where you get subsidies, and then it's quite a lot of money, uh, your insurance premium. Right, and uh, yeah. you know, in Swiss, Swiss, uh, Switzerland benefits from, uh, I, I mean, you know, a central bank that is reasonably tight with the money supply, so they can't just keep printing or keep borrowing uh, a lot of money to, to subsidize the welfare programs the way the way we have been here, or am I mistaken um, uh, in that regard? Uh, no, not not internally, but I think we are. Uh we hold a world record in in money printing and uh, and buying foreign assets to devalue the swiss franc so uh, the swiss national bank holds quite a lot of uh, us stocks and uh, yeah, european assets and uh, it's been a massive intervention um and, it, and it's not reflecting in the lot of inflation or, or price inflation or no, because the, I mean that money is uh, outside of the country. Okay. Because it was foreign assets they they bought to devalue the Swiss franc, but uh, once this money comes back, then then we will have the inflation. Right. Right. And yeah. that perhaps maybe the time when when you see a real change or or, or people being <laughs> really affected by these policies. Uh, yep. Mark, this is a uh, very enlightening. Um, anything else you wanted to add? about uh, uh, the Swiss system that we haven't talked about? Well, uh, well uh, tell me, may, may, let me ask you what you do. You know, you, you uh, got a master's in uh, uh, health economics. You, you became interested in, in this uh, topic. There, I know there's a group of Swiss physicians. I'm, I'm in touch with, with, uh, uh, with you, with, uh, with a couple of others who, you know, are viewing this with uh, concern not from a self-interested concern, but concern about the sustainability of the system and, and uh, how to introduce more, um, you know, free market solutions. Uh, do you see among doctors that there's a movement? Uh, how, how is that going? Of at least educating the other physicians about uh, the virtues of the free market? Uh, well, uh, I most of the times I get into trouble with other doctors talking about this uh, <laughs> subject because they're really uh, anti anti market solutions, and um, I think yeah, I don't know it's um, it's something that uh, doctors have a hard time even coming up with uh, curiosity about. 
you know, what is economics, uh, what does it mean, what does the market mean, what is it good for? So the prejudice is there beforehand and uh, you, you, can't, you can hardly speak to them. Sure, uh, well, uh, we will soon, I think, uh, I'm hoping soon we will have an episode um, really uh, uh, objecting to the objections uh, against uh, free markets in healthcare. Um, so the, the standard objections, I, I hope we'll, we'll have a chance to address those. So maybe we can have your your, yeah, uh, yeah. your colleagues listen to the podcast. And <laughs> well, actually, that was my uh, introduction into uh, into liberal health economics. Um, and, and you use the term liberal in a European sense, because here yeah, in the US, uh, liberal would be uh, uh, more of a. Then it's it would be pro market uh, healthcare, right. uh, because we have this uh, libertarian institute here in Zurich, and they um, produced. Uh, booklet on on the market and healthcare and uh, at the time when I was studying health economics I was a bit frustrated about uh, you know this uh, a neoclassical approach to to healthcare and it's all market failure so we need models and calculate uh, utilities and that didn't make sense to me and then I came across this uh, this book by the libertarian institute and I was uh, a lot more insightful so, so there is an interest in in keeping with this uh, libertarian tradition here, but I'm just afraid that people will not, um, you know, come up with uh, interest uh, in in reading uh, such literature. Well, uh, so you, you need to start a podcast. That's what you need to do. Podcast <laughs> for for Swiss physicians. About the yeah, of- yeah. It would be kind of a a, a counter. Um, um, counteract to the to prevailing uh, health economic uh, established structures here, uh, because people uh, don't question what uh, what uh, they are saying, and uh, it, it needs some map of position because uh, I think the nonsense is going too big. Correct, there. and don't don't give up because you know the the arguments for the market are really compelling if people really uh, hear them, and you know we haven't had a chance to 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 make those arguments on the podcast so far. But but the arguments are very compelling, and and the arguments of the other side, you know, the uh, the neoclassical economists who, who talk about market failures and utility curves and calculations, are really not compelling. So if people hear them, just like you were, uh, sort of intrigued and interested, and and uh, and then you you started to read uh, on your own and try to learn more, um, I think you you will eventually have a you, you know make an impact, uh, even if right now it seems daunting. Uh, same yeah. thing here, you know, in, in the United States. I mean, every medical journal is going to be is going to have a anti market bias for the most part, and and uh, and people are conditioned to thinking that that healthcare cannot uh, offer a, a market solution. You know, cannot have a, a market solution. So don't give up. Yeah, yeah. I still, uh, do we need to question first what is healthcare exactly. You know, what do we mean? Uh, which service? Because it's. We never know what we're talking about when we use healthcare, and all these discussions about the systems, and they they uh, don't lead anywhere because uh, that's very true. That's very true. Know? We've given up the, the the terms of the conversation uh, to to the the, the, the econometricians and, and the health policy people, but but we as physicians yeah. really have a say and can pave the way. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's just uh, one one uh, big argument that comes up here when I speak of uh, market and healthcare, and that is, uh, you know, in the US it doesn't work. Uh, it's the place where it's most expensive, and most people are underinsured, and they get bankrupt uh, once they enter the healthcare system. Um, so what would you say about that? Uh, it's, it's, it's correct, but it's because the, the healthcare, the American healthcare system has not been a, a free market by any stretch of the imagination. And that's been the case for a hundred years and it's been worse since then. And, um, and, and so at every step of the way, there is government intervention. Uh, and, it's, it, and it's done in a very harmful way, or it has been so far very harmful because uh, it, it's a, what we call crony capitalism, which is it's not, it's not free market, it's crony meaning there's government yeah. subsidies on a very, very large scale for private entities uh, to make money um, uh, off of uh, other people. And, and so, so there has been for a long time, you know, less or less effective price control 
uh, in the U.S. And that's why the um, uh, the fees have been so you know uh, sky you know so so high for so long. But but the uh, at the base of it is really very large subsidies and regulations favoring uh, special interests, and that's been the case yeah. Yeah. For, for many many years. And unless people really understand the historical development of, of how that that's happened. You really cannot call the American system uh, a market or a capitalistic system by any means. It's it's very um, there's very uh, heavy government intervention at every level. So that's, that's my answer. But but it's it's hard. Again, it's it's hard to make it. You have to to really show the history of it. And I have a couple of uh, blog pieces that I put on the show notes that that really outline this exact uh, uh, transition um, over the decades. You know, over the, the last hundred years. And, and when you look at it from this historical perspective, then yes, then you understand that how each government's intervention, whether it's, name, whether it's done in the name of uh, improving quality or uh, improving access and whatnot, inevitably results in, you know, if, if not less access or less quality, at least certainly more, uh, a more costly system. Yeah, so it, it sort of turns around. Uh, there are good intentions, but they lead to the opposite outcomes. Correct. And, uh, and to show that, you need to dig into history. And that's what I did too here. And uh, for the last, you know, to look at the last century uh, and what happened. And uh, that takes some work and effort. And that's right. You know, where's that information of that uh, uh, political decision back then? So, <laughs> and do people care? You know, would they read it? They do, they do. They believe it, they'll read it. So I, I will post on the show notes the two pieces that you've written. You've written one very kindly uh, on my blog a few years ago, uh, three years ago. And yep. then you wrote one more recently that was uh, perhaps more, uh, had a broader historical perspective about the Swiss healthcare system on, mm -hmm. on the, the blog of the, uh, the Mises Institute. And I'll, I'll have links to those, um, those two pieces. And uh, do, do you have a place, do you have a website or, or where that people can follow you or a Twitter handle uh, where people can? Well, I, I do have a website, but that's, uh, that's in German, so I don't think it. Well, with Google Translate, you never know, but we'll put that, we'll, we'll link to that uh, also. So if you can give me the link uh, later on, I'll put it on the show notes. Okay, I'll send it to you later on, yeah? Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> okay. Good. Mark, uh, it, it has been a pleasure. Uh, very, uh, very enlightening. I'm sure the audience will appreciate to, to hear what, uh, what's happening in Switzerland. And, um, and we'll keep in touch because, you know, if things change, you know, uh, we'd like to hear what, uh, how we change this so we can have a, a real-time commentary on government interventions. Sure, sure. Thank you. And uh, I think the, despite the differences between our two places, there are always the same similarities happening on, the, on this uh, economic level. Right. So, uh, it's good somebody uh, points a finger on it. <laughs> so, Unfortunate uh, similarities. Yeah, Very good, yeah. Mark. Okay. Yeah. Thank, so you, thank uh, you for the invitation. And, yep. Bye. Bye.